to sort of structure my uh, presentation today. I, I, I'll walk you through a long history of what has gone on in Myanmar over the last 60 years in terms of governance and politics and all that. Because in order to understand the present, you need to understand the past. And in order to determine the future, you need to understand the present, which has been built on the experiences of the past. So that's why I would walk you through various things that has happened over the last 60 years, and also over the last five years, which is very crucial and important. And then we will see what kind of situation we are in and what kind of uh, path we can map out for the future for ourselves, for Myanmar, and in general, as I would say, Asia. Change the slide, please. So that's my presentation framework tonight. I would say a little bit about me and my connections with Myanmar. I think it's very important for you to understand exactly what I do from there. Understanding Myanmar at multiple levels, at socioeconomic level, at the political and governance level. And I think more importantly, recently, we hoped a lot uh, to achieve through Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, who came up as a champion of democracy and human rights. And from my own experience and what I have seen since, I will try to understand her rise, her administration, accomplishments, challenges, and her own personal values and norms and attitudes, some of which that I myself personally was exposed to. So I will also share those experiences with you. And also, like we all know that we are all human beings and we all have to respond to conditions of human beings, particularly to their sufferings overseas. But in case of Myanmar, Australia is particularly well positioned to do something good to that country because we are a part of the region where Myanmar belongs. So that's very important. And so I would say a little bit, few things about Myanmar's significance to Australia. And then I would also elaborate the complexities of Myanmar that has happened over the years of various kinds of politics and administration and social and other cultural attributes that have affected Myanmar life and society. And then finally, I'll try and give some ideas and thoughts about where do you go from here? You know, so that's, that's how I'm trying to formulate my presentation tonight. Next slide, please. So let's talk about me and Myanmar. As you have been told that currently I'm um, at the School of Social Science. Um, I do some specialist teaching at the course, there's a course called Master Development Practice, but I spend most of my time supervising PhD and master level students, particularly in the area of broader areas of governance and development. And, um, uh, I also recently retired from UN. And in fact, the way I ended up here at the University of Queensland, when I was retiring, uh, one of my former friends, uh, this is a friend, uh, <laughs> Professor Jeffrey Lawrence, he sent me an email saying that I understand you are retiring. So what are your plans after you retire? I said, do nothing, just rest <laughs> and relax. And then he said, perfect. I've got a perfect job for you. Come and join us. <laughs> so that's precisely what I'm doing these days. Now, me and Myanmar, I was uh, in Myanmar during 1997 and 1999 and headed the UN's Human Development Initiative Support Program. And this was basically an integrated poverty alleviation program, which was spread out throughout the country. So that gave me an opportunity to visit various parts of the country, particularly the countryside, the villages, and had the you know, opportunity to meeting lots of people. This is also the time when um, military or Kathmandu, as uh, they call themselves, was in full control. Uh, and Aung San Suu Kyi was in house arrest. And Myanmar was under sanction from the West, meaning that there were limited foreign trade and foreign investment in the country and absolutely no foreign aid except the UN. And UN was to our governing council made to operate with two very rigid conditions. One, that we do not channel any of the aid to the government. We go directly to the poorest of the poor and we develop community-based organization 
and deliver resources on the basis of the priorities set by the communities. So this was a very unique kind of model that UN developed more by default than by design. And it worked, but it's all gone now. So, um, so that, that's, that's, where, that's what actually helped me to go very close to uh, the Myanmar society, the people and all, all that. And uh, experiences that I had, I still relish them. Um, during this period, Australian government, again, like most of the other governments, did not provide any government to government development assistance, but they were providing assistance through uh, their NGOs like Care Australia and mainly humanitarian aid, and mainly also in the minority ethnic areas. So that's, that's uh, what they're doing. During my time, I have also had the unique opportunity of visiting most parts of the country, particularly the part where the Rohingyas who have been recently persecuted and about a million of them been exiled into Bangladesh. So I had the opportunity of going there in 2000 and, uh, sorry, it was one, 1997, when there was still persecution, but it was not violent. It was still slow persecution, like the Rohingyas were not allowed to move from one village to another village without the permission of the local army chief. And they were asked to offer sort of kind of slave labor, but it's a voluntary labor for national building work, which basically meant going to the containment and working for the army. So that's how they were kind of uh, confined within their those areas. And one of the things, it was not written down in our uh, terms of reference in, in the UN, but unofficially we were also told to call on every now and then an Aung San Suu Kyi and brief her on the progress of our program. So that helped us to also have some interactions with her and get some feedback from her, and also helped us to understand her own personal attitude approaches to various issues that were confronting Myanmar at the time. For example, at one stage uh, during our briefing, she asked uh, how many of the NLD, uh, political parties, members have been benefited from our program. So we basically said that our program is actually targeting the poorest of the poor. We do not make any distinction between by political affiliation. So, I mean, so that's one of the things that uh, we came to. My current research interest is, because, as you said, is development. So development has implications for how politics is organized. Developments have implications on how international relations are organized. So that's what brings me discussing issues that are also of political nature of international nature. So let me now go back. The next slide, please. So let's try and see, understand the importance of Myanmar from another perspective. As you can see, that Myanmar is a quite a large country, 676 million uh, kilometers, square kilometers, population only 54 million, about 76 square kilometer. When you compare them with other neighbors, it is quite small. And it's a very resourceful country. It has got eight major ethnic groups. Bamas, are the major ethnic group, were also Buddhist. And 88% of the countries are Buddhist. Muslims are 6.2%, Christians are 4.3%, and the rest um, are uh, about animists and other religions. GDP per capita is uh, quite high. I mean, it's not too bad, $6,000 per capita. And when you look at the HDI figure, the Human Development Index, which includes uh, income, health, and other uh, attributes, social development attributes, uh, it's about in the middle. So it's not that bad. Uh, but when you disaggregate that data by ethnicity, uh, then you find the picture completely changes. You know, then there you can see that there are a lot of poverty, a lot of deprivation, a lot of problems of access to public health, public resources, and public utility. So that's what makes the difference in this country. So in order to understand Myanmar, aggregate figures do not always give you the right picture. You need to disaggregate figures to see exactly what is happening, happening below surface. In order to understand the politics, uh, next slide please. In order to understand the politics of Myanmar, I have actually divided them 
into three distinct periods. One is from 1947 to 1962. And this is the time when there were some attempts to democratize Myanmar, to practice uh, democracy in the country. Then the next period is, of course, uh, 1962 to 1988, the beginning of the military rule, the so-called Burmese socialism, and also period of isolation. This is the period when Myanmar completely isolated itself from the rest of the world. And now from 1988 to 2020, you have beginning military dictatorship, then there was military controlled quasi democracy. This is the period I said 2015 to 2000. And then back to dictatorship again and military repression. Next slide, please. So if, let's look at how Myanmar's politics has evolved in that country. 1949 to 1962, short-lived democracy. After a brief trial with democracy during 1949, Myanmar descended into military dictatorship. Now in 1949, Myanmar's uh, father of the nation, Aung San, was assassinated when he was holding a cabinet meeting. And since then, things have not been that great for Myanmar. There have been many attempts uh, to reestablish democracy, but the army came in very strongly. And also around that time, there were also ethnic minor sort of absurd in many parts of the country. So Myanmar, the military basically took over Myanmar and then they started controlling things since then. So from 1962 to 1974, <clears throat> the beginning of the more clearer overt <clears throat> military dictatorship, the junta, the military revolutionary government of Myanmar started ruling. And then from 1974 to 1988, is called the socialist government, the period of Burmese socialism, which was a unique kind of socialism. Basically, in practice, it meant army controlling most of the economy, army controlling and deciding who should produce what, what should be transacted in the market and what cannot be. So it was a complete control. And they, this is also the period they completely withdrew themselves from the rest of the world. So there was not that many internet changes or ideas or nothing. To the rest of the world. So Myanmar became a completely isolated dark spot uh, in the world and especially in Asia. Then in 1988, of uh, course, resentments were growing and then there was a coup and army took over. Next slide, please. So what we find after that, I mean, nothing has changed much. Till 1988, things have gone from basically from bad to worse actually. And in 1998, the junta called themselves SLORC, which is State Law and Order Revolutionary Council. It's basically the military cabinet. That's how they rule the whole country. Then full dictatorship with no provision of citizen participation in anything and limited opening of the economy because they realize, the army realized that they need foreign investment, they need foreign trade to progress. So they allowed a little bit, not a lot. I mean, there was a, only one foreign bank at the time. Uh, it was uh, only Chartered or Greenleaf Bank. Uh, there's no other foreign bank. It's all Myanmar's nationalized bank. There are also no private banks in the country. Then in 19, it should be 1988, uh, the National League for Democracy with Aung San Suu Kyi as the chair formed and participated and wins 1990 election. In 1990, there was a, local government election uh, by election and their own they probably i think out of 46 or whatever they won most of the seats and that kind of shaken the army a bit uh, but then what happened after that uh, the slog sort of converted itself called spdc state development um, planning and development council or something like that Basically, they wanted to give a new face to their old face, basically. And they wanted to say they are trying to be more engaging. They are trying to invite more international investments into the country. They invited the foreign governments to come and give foreign aid. But not many people responded that warmly. So this continued. And in the meantime, around 2008, uh, the military drafted a constitution. 
uh, is called Constitution 2008. So that's the year they drafted the Constitution. And that Constitution had some very interesting provisions in it. For example, um, it uh, adopts a parliamentary system of government through election, but reserves 25% of the parliamentary seats for the army. So that's fixed. So you can't, you can't change that. Then keeps several vital ministries under the control of the army. For example, home ministry, defense, and civil administration. So these are the ministries that actually control the entire country. It's a colonial setup that, that, that they inherited, and they actually basically strengthened it and made it stronger to control, use it more for surveillance and, uh, and, and control and all that. So this is what they, they, they did. And then another provision was they barred the elected members with foreign spouses of children from holding key public offices. So if you are married to a foreigner, you cannot even go far regimes, you cannot be a prime minister or president or a minister, or, or if you have children of foreign born, then this is the problem you face. So that, that's another. So, so basically when you look at constitution 2008, it actually made military in Tadmadao an independent organ, so basically a state within a state. You had no control of what they do. So even though a lot of people welcome uh, 2008 constitution as a transition to democracy, but it was actually a dictatorship in a cloak of democracy. It was never a democracy in that sense. Um, so, so in 2010, they had an election and LD and Aung San Suu Kyi could not participate because their party was still banned. Uh, they could not, they, they were deregistered at that time. However, in 2015, by then, NLD and the party was deregistered and they participated and they won with a landslide victory and they formed the government. Then 2000, and then there are various things I will discuss what happened in between later. But in 2020, again, Aung San Suu Kyi and her party, this time they won two third majority in the parliament. And this is when army saw this as a threat to their authority and they acted. And they had the instrument to act because it is all in, embedded within the constitution that if for some reason the army feels that the country's sovereignty is at stake, its security at stake, they have the authority to react and, and change things. And that's exactly what they did. So if you think that army has done an illegal thing, it is not. They have done an immoral thing, but not an illegal thing because it is all embedded into the constitution that we never actually saw would be used against people and people's verdict. But that's exactly what they did. Next slide, please. So if we try and analyze and understand you know, what has gone on in Myanmar in terms of governance uh, over the last 60 years, we can see that Myanmar's military ruled the country for almost six decades without a break. And that's, that's continuous. And when you have a system of that nature operating for 60 odd years, it affects a lot of things in the society. It affects the way you react. It affects the way society gets done and all that. So that's, we have to keep that in mind. Then given Myanmar's ongoing ethnic conflicts, literally see itself uh, as an agency protecting the union from disintegration. And you, you must be reminded that these ethnic areas are also colonial construction uh, in the sense that during the colonial period, the Burmese nationalist movement were always challenging the British colonial authority. And the Brits basically encouraged divide and rule by creating divisions between the ethnic minority and the Bama uh, majority. So that conflicts over the years, what was political has now become cultural, a habit, an attitude, a behavior. So you, you have to be able to understand how these things evolved over the years. And I'm not condoning what's going on, but I'm just saying that we need to reflect and see what contributes to what, what influences what, why, why has it, things are working the way it is done. And so, so Myanmar feels, so the military feels that they have the responsibility 
to protect the country from disintegration. And mind you, the, these ethnic areas like Karen area, Chin area, or Rohingya area, were never part of Myanmar or Burma, Greater Burma. These are all independent entities before. It's British who brought them together. So Myanmar has to learn to live together with diversity, but they haven't done that yet. So uh, in Myanmar, military is a state within a state, as I said, mm -hmm. and, and the only problem, and therefore any challenge to this authority, perceived or real, is bound to be responded and thwarted with extreme violence. And that's exactly what we're witnessing now. And military also regards, you know, the 2020 Suchi and LD landslide election victory with two third majority a threat to his hold on power mm -hmm. because they could easily use that majority and change the constitution. And this is what they're afraid of. They didn't want to you know, allow that to happen. So the army crackdown on protesters has happened because of all this, because they felt threatened, they're challenged. And by now, you know, more than 1,000 people have been killed and this counting is going on and bloodshed is relentless. So we don't know when you could stop and how we can stop it. And that's something that we'd like to discuss now. Now, let me turn to the next slide, please. Now, let me now turn to Aung San Suu Kyi and her style of governance uh, and, and uh, some of her values that we have seen since. And when I was there, I was also at the privilege of noticing some. Now, during 1988 to 2015, it is her political activism and her charisma that actually mobilized the bodies against the military. There is no doubt about that. And she, she was she's always been regarded highly and still regarded highly by the Myanmar people as their savior, because <clears throat> she also happens to be the daughter of the father of their nation. So she, she is a highly regarded and highly worshipped uh, personality in the country. And she, she made, made it her NLD a formidable force against military. There is no doubt about that. And as the daughter of the father of the nation, um, you know, she became the face of resistance in the, in the country, as her father used to be in the British colonial period. He was the face of the resistance. So. And, and um, became hugely popular both within and outside Myanmar, earned international adulation as the champion of democracy and an icon of human rights and won Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 while in house arrest. The French director, Luc Besson, made a movie on Suji called Le Lady, and it became famous all around the world. So in 2010, first election under the constitution 2008, Suji NLD was unable to participate because NLD was still deregistered. In 2011, Myanmar Election Commission re-registered NLD. In 2015, they participated, they won, and we know they've since you know, run the country for five years, and again won with the two-third majority, but army has stayed the coup. There is no country where breakouts, protests everywhere, and army responds with extreme violence. Suji is now under house arrest, facing several criminal charges, including charge of election fraud and corruption. And you know, protests and army violence continue. So where do you go from here? Now, let us try and understand Suchi a little bit and her values and her you know, bearings on the government. During her reign, Aung San Suu Kyi revealed several personal characteristics that have had bearings on her style of governance. She has, although she has been sort of promoted as an icon of human rights, but facts would suggest that she was no icon of human rights. During her rule, Suu Kyi defended the military's Rohingya genocide. You know, almost, uh, I think about 10, 12,000 people have been killed, hundreds and thousands of women have been raped and mutilated. About 10 million Rohingyas have been expelled and exiled into Bangladesh, uh, where they are now languishing in the refugee camps. And yet, she went out internationally, all over the world, 
defending the army against the, this genocide uh, allegations. So that really made her at the end a sort of an international persona non grata. Now, what is of interest also to suggest that this is not something that's very new with her. When I was uh, in Myanmar, uh, as I said, that we, as a part of our arrangement, we had to brief her every now and then about our program. And at that time, I was also visiting the Rohingya area and we gathered Western information was going on at that stage. It was at that stage in well, 1997, some form of slow genocide. It was not a huge persecution as we've seen later. So we would come and brief her about a lot of things, but the moment we raised the issue of Rohingya, she would demonstrate utmost ambivalence to whatever is happening. She would just look the other way, you know, which we found quite, quite astounding. But that's exactly what we noticed. And later, as you know, that you know, she not only denied uh, what had happened, but she actually defended the army. Uh, is the genocide uh, delegation which was made by UN. <laughs> and she warmed up to the Myanmar's uh, sectarian Buddhist monks as well, uh, that fomented uh, uh, hatred against uh, and supported Rohingya persecution. And also what's interesting is there were two Myanmar reporters who actually risked their life, went to the Rohingya areas, documented you know, audiovisually what was going on and broadcasted it. And these two, uh, yes, uh, these two reporters were then arrested by the government, tried, and jailed. And she actually termed them as traitors. So that's that kind of reveals the kind of character. Here. Another interesting revelation about her is that her lawyer, Ko uh, Win or Ko uh, Nee, who is a Muslim Indian origin lawyer, who all along defended. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi in various cases. And not only that, when she won the election in 2015, and because the constitution barred her from taking any position in the government, is this particular lawyer who found a loophole in the constitution and created this position of state councillor, which then she occupied and became the de facto leader of Myanmar. Now, what's interesting is this particular lawyer was hated by the army. So once one of the days uh, he went to Thailand or Bangkok, returned from Bangkok and the airport, he picked his uh, five-year-old grandson and as he was walking out to the taxi, someone came and shot him through his head. And the five-year-old child was thrown straight away. He was instantly dead. Aung San Suu Kyi even did not send out a message of condolence, not to speak of even doing a proper investigation of this murder case. And people still believe that it was one of the army colonels who actually did this assassination. So, so these are kind of very sad uh, aspects uh, of her self, of, of her character that never revealed themselves when she was in her dress. She looked more like a champion of democracy, which probably she is, but certainly to me, she's not a champion of human rights. You know, so that's, 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 that's the way I, I would say it. And also, while she has been a champion of democracy, she believed in participating in election and, and when she got herself elected, her party got elected. Within the party, she never encouraged the democratic practices. She was very autocratic and in fact, very cultist. And what happened is, and one of the reasons that NLD probably will suffer because she really, really never allowed leadership to grow within the party. She was surrounded by the whole bunch of people who are basically loyalists. So she picked loyalty over quality, and that's also a problem. So the NLD and her future, I think, is a, it's a bit problematic. I have been told to hurry up. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. So if we are looking for a framework for our future policy approach on the Australian side. So this is the, a broad theoretical framework that I have developed. So the military governance has manifested themselves into these aspects. Aung San Suu Kyi's own government has created this, and this is where we have to go. So we have to first understand 
the significance? Why should Australia be so interested in Myanmar? Then the complexities, then you know how we have been dealing with this. Next slide, please. So in terms of significance, you know, Myanmar used to be one of the richest country in Asia. Bad policy, bad politics has made it a poor country. So those resources are still there, potentials are still there, and we are, we are part of Asia. We have much to gain from them, and they have much to gain from us. So it makes economic sense for Australia to be deeply engaged as uh, Myanmar conditions. Geostrategy, obviously Myanmar borders China, India, Thailand, Bangladesh, and Laos, 40% of the world's population. So how can you ignore a country uh, which borders such huge area and population? So it is very important geostrategically and also economically. So Australia, uh, should be very mindful of this and, and develop a system of develop an approach which can actually contribute to lasting peace and harmony in Myanmar. Next slide, please. I'll just quickly go through. So <laughs> if we look at the past trend, Australian approach to Myanmar has been fluctuating, sometimes warm, sometimes cool. So there was no, no consistent approach to Myanmar yet. And obviously not Australia, but the entire world had misplaced trust in Aung San Suu Kyi. And we can see that you know, she has passed many of our expectations. And then overall, I would say that during Aung San Suu Kyi period, it lacked moral underpinning. Because when the Rohingya persecution <laughs> was going on, we still maintain our military assistance, uh, our assistance to military. And, and also police in Myanmar. So that, that definitely lacks underpinning. So we need to have a new thinking and a completely new strategy uh, for the future. Next slide, please. So what are the complexities? I mean, there are tremendous amount of complexity. For example, you know, as you can see, the dictatorship, uh, the control, the fear of army, uh, the, the, the threat from the army, the violence, these are embedded into the monetary, in, in Myanmar's political system and political arrangement. And this has been going on for the last 60 years. So army controls also the vital sectors of the economy. They control many industries, many trades, many institutions. So they are deeply in control of everything, economy, politics. Everything. So how do you go about it? And the other problem that we have is the Bamar attitudes towards other ethnic minorities. It is exclusionary. So if you have a democracy in a society which has a, some kind of cultural exclusionary behavior, then you only strengthen and deepen exclusion and do not promote inclusion. So we have to think of a way how we can actually promote inclusion with democracy, not without democracy. So we have to think how best to do that. Then. There are diplomatic impediments. For example, even though this terrible violence is going on in Myanmar, you have countries like Russia, China, is still siding with uh, the military. And much worse, one of our quad members, India, is also siding with Myanmar. So we, we are in a very difficult position. So wh where do you go? What do you do from this kind of uh, juggernaut that we have been thrown into? So, but, you know, UN says that if this violence continues for a while and the way the ethnic minorities are reacting and also with violence, it may soon become a failed state. And that would be a dangerous prospect, not just for Myanmar, but for entire Asia. So no action is no option. So we have to act, we have to do something about it. Next slide, please. So there are immediate step would be to do something to stop the violence. And how do you do about the war? I mean, UN could not pass a resolution because Russia and China obviously vetoed. So we have to think of a more creative way of engaging actors that can help stopping the violence. That's the immediate task. We have to do that. The second task is uh, let me.
So medium to long term, this is where we have to focus more and slowly build up our policies. Help promoting peace and stability through promotion of democracy and democratic values, which implies amendment to or abrogation of the constitution in 2008. Without changing that constitution or without drafting a new constitution that guarantees the rights of all people, equality of all people, nothing will happen. I mean, elections will happen, elections will come and go, but situation on the ground will not change. So we have to somehow do that. And the operating framework, how do you do it? We have to use the global framework like UN. We have to use regional frameworks like cooperating with countries that matter. And then of course, bilaterally, we should do as much as we can. Now, my last slide, change like this, is what I'm trying to suggest here. One more slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to suggest here is this. That's Myanmar's, uh, you know, Australia's long term peace and security in Asia is something that we should be focusing on. And, and Myanmar is one of the cases which is linked to how we approach, how we position ourselves vis a vis Asia uh, such. And that's very important. And in this regard, what I would like to refer to is an interesting thing called Paul Keating's map of Asia. When he was the prime minister of all the prime ministers or governments he had in Australia, he aggressively aligned Australia and Asia because he had the vision to see how the dynamics are changing at political level, economic level, at security level. And he realized that without integrating ourselves with Asia, uh, we will not prosper. And he's greatly succeeded. And in many ways, Australia has benefited from that. Our trade, our investment, our tourism, education sector, everything benefited from it. And at that time, he was also trying to get Australia politically positioned within many Asian groups. But one gentleman, Mr. Dr. Mahathir Mahmoud, would have nothing to do with it, the Malaysian prime minister. He would not like to see Australia as part of Asia. So in one of the press conferences in Kuala Lumpur, uh, an Australian journalist showed this map to Mr. Mahathir Mohammed and said, look, Mr. Mahathir, have you seen this map drawn by our Prime Minister Paul Keating, which shows that Australia is part of Asia, but you wouldn't like to accept that. So Dr. Mahathir Mohammed said that whether you guys are a part of Asia or not, to understand that, don't look at the map, look at the mirror. Now, that was a very rude and racist <laughs> comment. And Mr. Mahathir Mohammed is not known for anything better. <laughs> but Mr. Paul Keating's map was not for Mr. Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, just for the Asians, for us to actually understand how we should formulate our policy vis a vis the region. And that, that is quite important. So, the way it implies that we must calibrate our foreign policy to bolster the security and prosperity, mm -hmm. as per Bob Carr within and not from the region. And we have shifted our gaze from that map and moved somewhere else in the last decade or so. And it is causing a lot of problem. And my final statement would be, we have to be mindful that old mindsets are poor tools to address new realities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. Um, it's very interesting and also very enlightening presentation. Uh, now, it's a question answer time. Uh, I would like to invite, I'll take a question for Dr. Khan to answer. Um, I'd like to invite from the floor first, while the um, online participant can also um, hold it. Yeah, okay. Um, so if they type them in the chat, yep. they'll come through to me. I'll write them down. Oh, the right. Chat. Okay. Sounds good. Right, so questions from, yeah. David. Yeah, but you can see why the military has cracked down so hard. I mean, the military and the families associated with the military are the economic elite and they enjoy an amazing standard of living compared to the rest of the economy. But if, I think this time the, uh, the opposition is probably going to try and uh, resist the military for a long time. Is the military monolithic? If 
things get too bad and the international situation gets worse, could there be sort of splits within the, the military about how it's dealing with the situation? Um, well, military has, is not the first time they are in this situation. Mm. They have been there for the last 40 years. Actually. They were in complete isolation. Mm. There was nothing happening. Only thing that has changed is that uh, since uh, 2015, the military has also gained quite a bit. Mm. But that gains have not been equally distributed even within the military. Okay. So there are vested interests in the military to see a change. Mm -hmm. So if violence continues, and if uh, uh, this is what I think, and if Myanmar continues to get more and more isolated and uh, from the rest of the world, along with Myanmar, military itself will suffer. Mm -hmm. So there will be people from within who may actually resist uh, that uh, the status quo of suffering. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, I would not rule out completely, but at this particular point of time, I don't see anything happening because if they can withstand this pressure for another month or so, things will settle down. In 1988, in one day, they killed 2,000 people. They closed all the universities, schools, everything. And that state of things continued for 10 years. But things may have changed a little bit more. But at the same time, don't forget that they have powerful allies, like China, Russia, India. So I don't know. I mean, anything is possible, but we don't know. Thank you. Professor Khan, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was keen to get uh, your insights as to the motivation between, uh, behind some of those powerful allies uh, in that one can well appreciate uh, motivation for China, uh, given its uh, proximity and the access to Myanmar's resources. But what about for Russia and India? Can you explain as to why they are supportive of the military? Yeah. Russia recently has done a very significant defense pact with Myanmar military. And Myanmar military is buying huge amount of Russian weapons. So they have a vested interest in that. India is obviously very strategically located. And that particular area in the north, they are also trying to develop it as an economic zone joint economic projects and all that. And also uh, they are trying to, Myanmar government is also trying to balance influence of China a bit. So they're trying to diversify their alliances with other countries. So that's, that's the, for India, the main incentive is to is an economic incentive and some geostrategic incentive as well. They don't want China to, to be at their doorstep. So if they can develop some relationship with uh, the military, then they would be able to neutralize that to some extent. Thank you. Um, just uh, two brief, quick questions. Like um, the first one is like you know the the lack of the action from the Western countries is, is because do you think it's because Hong Kong to is a European policy? That's a first question. Um, the second question is that how can China benefit from the current situation? What about the Aung San Suu Kyi? Like you know, the lack of you know the actions from Western countries. Do you think it's because of Aung San Suu Kyi's Rohingya's policy, apart from like blockage at the United uh, Nations? Well, I, I well, I don't think uh, that is because of lack of uh, Rohingya policy. Uh, mainly because during that time when the Rohingya persecution was going on. The West simply expressed that concern, did not condemn. It's the civil society in the Western countries, the media, who reacted strongly against them. So, uh, in terms of uh, West's relationship with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, has changed uh, quite a bit, but not significantly, radically shifted quite a bit. But at the same time, you see, the problem with the Western government is, or for any government, she is an elected leader. So you cannot ignore someone who is an elected leader. Okay, so that, that's that's the main issue. And the second question is uh, like China. Yeah, China. Okay, China's of course. If this is exactly what we as an Australian need to convince the Chinese that look, if this kind of trouble goes on, conflict goes on, it's not in your interest to see this isn't happening in your doorstep. So of course China would not benefit because if really civil war breaks out everywhere and a lot of these areas are actually borders China, 
it would be a serious situation even for China. So it's not in China's interest that they would like to see this continue over a long period of time. But China needs to be assured that their own security, their own geopolitical interests are not threatened or challenged by others coming closer to Myanmar. That, that's what is important. Thank you. Piggybacking on, the, on, on that answer, is there any role for R2P in this department? R2P is what? Uh, responsibility. responsibility to protect. Oh, okay. Sure. I mean, civil society is a very important instrument of changing policies all over the world. Governments, as the woman once said, that governments have no intention of changing if people do not demand change. So civil society, the people, with organizations like R2P, they represent the people's voices. If they can create tremendous amount of uh, uh, demand for change, they can certainly do. So my suggestion would be, I think we need to help the Australian government and its foreign policy to formulate in a way so that it, it separates two issues. One is the immediate violence, how do you stop it? Then you go from medium to long-term policies. So that's very important. And there, organization like R2P can do some research, more consultations, and then help with the policy inputs. Yeah, I'll go. Can you speak a little bit about the role of the Buddhist hierarchy in the, in the events leading up to and the current situation? I mean, this is something very, very unfortunate. Like, uh, as I said before, my wife uh, was tremendously immersed into Burmese Buddhist spirituality and the core values, which are based on two principles, ahimsa, which is uh, non-violence, and tolerance, you know, mutual respect for each other. But unfortunately, Buddhism has got mixed up with Bama nationalism. And, and that has made them extremely xenophobic. And, and so, uh, and, and even call it a Buddhist nationalism is an insult to Buddha and his preachings and his teachings. So I would say it is simply Bama nationalism. It's got nothing to do with Buddhism. <clears throat> Interestingly, the after, Myan after Myanmar, I was transferred to uh, Sri Lanka, and that's also yeah. a Buddhist country. And there is the monks who actually influenced their government policies on Tamils and they would not agree with anything short of violence or war. And I have had many discussions with many monks and they think they said, no, war is the only answer. So uh, the, the problem is when you try to cause you up to any religious groups anywhere in the world and make them part of the politics, it can create problems. It has created problems for many Christian countries, many Muslim countries, as you can see, and it has created problems for Buddhists. I mean, the Buddhists were incorporated into the politics when Mr. Nguyen took power because he wanted to legitimize uh, this, uh, the military government with the blessings of the Buddhists because Myanmar people are very spiritual, very religious minded. So whatever the monks say, <laughs> they, they get warmed up to it. They don't support it. Um, I'll take one more question from the floor and then I will go to the online participants. A few uh, questions here already. All right, um, I've got a few questions here from online. Um, I'll try to read for you yeah. and um, we can read together. Maybe. So sure this um, the um, question from John, um, I don't have his last name, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, with the Disali, this, this alliance of the Western and South Korean um, trades and the alienation of China. Who, who does um, Myanmar's military hope to trade with Japan or any other neighbors? So, yeah, I think push. Thank you. So it's basically saying that the alienation from the Western and also the South Korean trade and the alienation from China. Um, so who does Myanmar want to trade with? Well, certainly, I don't think Japan will be that keen to trade with Myanmar in current conditions. In conditions of instability, regardless of whether it is fomented by military or a civil government, no one wants to trade with no country. So, and, and 
if you are in Asia and the China is the biggest uh, trader and investor, in fact, half of Myanmar has been built by China. This new capital is built by China. So if China says something, it has a lot of weight in that country. So I do not think that um, Myanmar can afford to alienate China that long. So I think it is in our interest. We, have, we should negotiate with China and find a solution for Myanmar. We should negotiate with China to stop the violence immediately. Because if China continues to support the military, any prospect of violence uh, sort of stopping is removed. So yeah, but I, your question is that China is not alienated yet, but it could get alienated if Myanmar army starts to ignore China, which I think they wouldn't. But if they do, I don't think China, Japan would be that keen to come and help out Myanmar. That's completely out. But the junta don't care, do they? They yeah. don't, so they they don't, don't care whether anyone, yeah. I mean, they're like uh, Albania, they don't mind. Yeah. I, I, as I said, they have been in this situation for 40 years. But I think the world has changed a lot. It's much more integrated in terms of economic system, in terms of political system. Yeah. So that ideological isolation is not possible anymore. So if they have to survive, they have to have, you see, one thing you must realize, we are in globalized capitalist system. The whole world is integrated into it. So two things do not go together, capitalism and conflict. So you have to resolve conflict to benefit from capitalism. And I, have, I don't think there is any option other than participating in world capitalist system with, of course, greater social uh, component. All right, the next question is from Elster. Um, is there the possibility that the current political um, and human rights violation will see the Rohingya crisis become a historical footnote and the, um, that one million refugees are even more isolated? I think it is just not Rohingya. Uh, the entire ethnic minority situation in Myanmar needs to be looked at more holistically, more, more differently. And that's what I'm saying, that while the cry for reinstallation of a democracy is important, but the demand for uh, <coughs> human rights aspects uh, and their incorporation into the constitution is absolutely key. So when it comes to the Rohingya situation, along with Rohingya, all other ethnic area should be given some sort of an autonomy and be made to operate under a federating unit of Myanmar and not a centralist government that we have at the moment. And that is where the problem is. So it is not necessarily that the violence will see uh, automatically that Myanmar going the situation is resolved and you know refugees will return. The whole country has to go for a, some sort of a solution that is a solution for all the ethnic minorities, just not for them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. I think the question answer time is now nearly finished. And I would like uh, to invite uh, David Costello, our yes. secretary, to give the announcement for the next. Well, thank minutes. you very much, uh, you. Dr. Khan. That was a very incisive and illuminating talk on a situation which I think this year has surprised and distressed a lot of us. And of course, with your deep personal connections uh, to Myanmar and also your experience of dealing with Aung San Suu Kyi, that you really sort of uh, brought it home to us. And we do have, so I'd like to invite uh, everyone to uh, the next We've got a couple of things coming up, a very special one on April 27th, we've got Lady Rosalind Moriata. She was the former first lady of PNG and she's a Queenslander. Uh, she's going to be talking about the Global Fund and the fight against COVID-19. Now, the Global Fund was set up to battle AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, but uh, COVID has, has come in and made their job much harder. And I think uh, getting her was a terrific uh, coup for us and it would be great if you could come along on April 27th. May 24, we've got an event that was postponed from last year. It's Greg Wood. He's the director of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. He's going to be talking about making transport safer for everyone. He's got sort of uh, links with the worldwide transport associations as well. 
May 20, Ted O'Brien, he's the federal member for Fairfax on the Sunshine Coast. He's going to be talking about the China question, which uh, of course we discussed China tonight. Uh, and uh, China is a big challenge for Australia in, in foreign policy. Before he went into politics as an LMP member, he uh, had 20 years of business experience in China. So uh, he's a very lucid sort of guy as well. So I think May 20 is one date to put in your diary. Okay, well, I think that uh, takes us out for tonight. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, uh, both the people here and also the people who are online. And uh, that's all from AAA Queensland for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.